Anomalous creatures in the SCP Foundation's universe are not a rarity. Dealing with anomalous sapien life forms is the Foundation's bread and butter, whether it's talkative sea slugs or a body stealing swarm of ants. For those of you who haven't read their Ethics Committee guidebooks, mm. sapien anomalies are defined as creatures who have a keen sense of self awareness and can communicate. From the zaniness of Dr. Bright and his amulet to the neck cracking SCP 173, these sapient anomalous entities come in all shapes and sizes. But when does a creature become so sapient they can be considered anomalous? Take the humble octopus, for example, who also just so happens to be the subject of today's video. The octopus is a boneless, eight-legged creature capable of shifting the color and texture of its skin and will blast predators with a black substance to blind them. If I read that in an SCP Foundation file, I might think those researchers found an alien creature. But no, octopi, or octopodes, are, as you know, real living, breathing creatures you can see at any aquarium. Another interesting quirk of octopods is their intelligence. These creatures are smart, extremely smart. Hell, they'll even use fallen coconuts as a sort of armor against enemies. If tool use isn't intelligence, I don't know what is. You may be wondering, how can you make an octopus more anomalous than what I've already described? Well, today on SCP Explained, we'll be taking a look at SCP-2967, the sapient cephalopods, to answer that exact question. We've all probably been to aquariums. Dark, ambient rooms where the only light comes from behind the massive tanks filled to the brim with colorful fish and crustaceans. They can be fun to explore, but when you've seen a bunch of exotic fish once, it's not like you're clamoring to get back in soon. This was the problem faced by the Galaxy Aquarium in May of 2010. Attendance was low, and profit was lower. The owner of the aquarium was a man by the name of Mark Hemphill. He was young and extremely ambitious. Mark had an interest in marine life since he was a child and dedicated his life to studying the creatures of the sea. When he opened the aquarium, he had just gotten out of college. He hoped his passion and his aquarium would inspire even just one child to pursue the study of marine life as he did. Mark's ambitious personality was not going to let him watch his life's work go to waste. At a nearby auction house, the anomalous group of interest Marshall, Carter, and Dark were organizing a showing for their new batch of anomalous creatures available for bidding. Seasoned viewers of SCP Explained have likely run into anomalies that Marshall, Carter, and Dark have had a hand in. For those not in the loop, Marshall, Carter, and Dark are dealers of anomalous goods and services, selling anomalies to the highest bidder, no matter who they are. From the average Joe to a tyrannical dictator, Marshall, Carter, and Dark only care about cold, hard cash and getting as much of it as they can. Mark, hearing whispers of a massive auction coming up, decided to attend. He entered the auction house, an old dilapidated warehouse on the sketchy side of town. Not exactly inspiring confidence, but Mark thought maybe, just maybe, there would be something for him to add to his aquarium to get more attendees. Mark walked through the heavy metal doors to an immaculate auction space. The building was loaded with well-dressed individuals who gazed over the items they had for sale. Wooden tables lined the walls of the warehouse, and on top of each table were tanks and cages of creatures Mark never thought could exist. From dogs that smelled like candles to purple frogs that telepathically communicated with the people around them, Mark was convinced that there was something here he could use. A staff member approached Mark almost immediately. It was as if the staff could smell the willingness to spend money on him. She was an older woman, dressed in a fine purple-hued suit. She spoke with a comforting candor to Mark, asking him about his day and what brought him to the auction house. She introduced herself as Jay and said that the auction house had just the thing for Mark before he could even get the words out. They walked to the opposite side of the building, where a purple curtain was erected. Walking through, it was as if Mark had returned back to his aquarium. What were the odds that this place would have a marine life section? Oddly, for such a well-designed room, there was only one small tank placed in it. Within it was six octopodes, a pale yellow in color. Mark immediately recognized the species as the common octopus. The Galaxy Aquarium already had a cephalopod section with much more rare species than the common octopus. Dejected, Mark almost gave up hope before Jay approached the tank and kneeled. Jay seemed concerned and called out the name Levi. From under the table on which the tank stood, a massive octopus slithered into sight, startling Mark. 
It was at least five feet in height and length. That's impossible, Mark thought. There's no way that an octopus of this species could get to be this large. The octopus's size was not the only oddity it held, though. Jay began to scold Levi for leaving its tank and asked what it had to say for itself. She threw a Sharpie marker to the ground for Levi, who uncapped it and began to write out the word, sorry, on the concrete floor. This couldn't be, Mark thought. There was absolutely no way that an octopus can learn to understand English, let alone write it. Jay turned to Mark, encouraging him to talk to Levi. Uh, what's your name? Mark asked sheepishly. He couldn't believe he was trying to talk to an octopus. As soon as the words left his mouth, the octopus spelled out L-E-V-I with its marker. Mark couldn't believe it. This had to be some trick, right? Some sort of marketing gimmick to get him to buy an overgrown piece of calamari. There is no way that an octopus could have self-awareness. Mark knew they were smart, of course. He had studied these things for years. But knowing its name, that's not possible. What are you? Mark questioned, hoping to figure out if it was an animatronic instead of a living, breathing animal. Levi began to write on the floor again. Not a word this time, but a symbol. The octopus first drew a large oval, then eight lines coming from the bottom, a crude drawing of an octopus. Behind Levi, the other six octopodes were watching him as spectators, seeming to clap when Levi finished the drawing. Jay, with a smug grin on her face, asked Mark if he was impressed. The look on Mark's face already told the story, so Jay began to go over the pricing of the creatures. Levi and the other six octopodes were a package deal, with a starting bid for all seven placed at $3,000. Mark, without a second thought, asked if he could outright purchase Levi and his compatriots for $10,000. Jay's smile grew wider, and she shook Mark's hand without another word said. Levi and the six other octopodes were delivered to the Galaxy Aquarium the next day. Within that time, Mark had already prepared an unused section for the arrival of his new attraction. The cephalopods were placed in their tanks without much difficulty and settled into their new home. Advertising began for the Galaxy Aquarium's newest attraction, the Talking Octopus. Mark even splurged on a billboard on the nearby highway. This investment was meant to save the aquarium, and for the next few months, attendance skyrocketed. Now we know why the SCP Foundation keeps a heavy watch over anomalous entities in the public, because all it takes is one ambitious person before the entire world knows that anomalies exist. With the popularity of Levi, it was a matter of time before the SCP Foundation heard of it. It was time for an investigation. Site-12 was a site dedicated to marine life, and as such, many of the personnel stationed there had the appropriate expertise to deal with the anomaly. Agent Hooper volunteered for the investigation. He was ordered to pose as an animal behavior specialist from the Sea Coral Pacific Federation, real creative there, SCP Foundation. It just so happened that at the same time Agent Hooper was getting involved, Levi was beginning to give Mark a hard time at his aquarium. It was a late night in January 2011. The aquarium had since closed after another day of almost full attendance. Levi was not sleeping, however. He was hungry, and by coincidence, the section of the Galaxy Aquarium next to Levi's tank was a potential all-you-could-eat buffet should his plan come to fruition. The next day, aquarium staff awoke to the filtration system of the crab enclosure being blocked by one of Levi's friends. It was quickly removed and placed back into its proper tank. It wasn't out of the ordinary for octopodes to escape their tanks. As I explained, they are smart creatures. Aquarium staff began the process of moving the crabs to a temporary tank, while repairs and cleaning on the original tank were taking place. As their attention was drawn to the damaged filter and contaminated crab tank, Levi managed to escape and enter the unguarded temporary tank of crabs. Broken shells and water splattered the floor of the temporary tank room as the feast began. It was a massacre. Levi ate 20 of the 40 crabs and another 10 were dropped off into the octopus's tank for Levi's comrades. Satisfied with its meal, Levi returned to his tank as if nothing had happened. An hour passed before the leftovers of Levi's dinner were discovered, and it didn't take much guessing on the part of aquarium staff to deduce who was behind this. Agent Hooper arrived the next day and asked to meet with Mark. Hooper explained that he was from the Sea Coral Pacific Federation, and his place of employment had heard of Levi and wanted to study him. 
Mark, like a moth to a flame, eagerly took the opportunity to describe the remarkable events of the previous day. Hooper nodded along with the story and promised to figure out why Levi was acting this way. Agent Hooper was escorted to the talking octopus section of the aquarium and asked for some privacy, which he was granted. Levi was sitting on a large mound of sand, while the smaller octopods sat in front of it as if they were intently listening. Levi was apparently lecturing the group, using a sharp rock to carve words and pictures on the plexiglass walls of the tank. Agent Hooper knocked on the glass, startling the group. In anger, Levi swam to the front of the tank and stared at Agent Hooper. With a tentacle, it knocked hard on the glass and then endeavored to return to its lecture. Agent Hooper didn't catch the hint that he was unwelcome, and stayed uncomfortably close to the glass until Levi couldn't ignore the agent any longer. The octopus held up five tentacles and made a shooing motion towards Hooper, who was incredibly surprised. Hooper recognized the motion as the phrase, go away, in sign language. Hooper responded, asking Levi, sign language? in sign language. In response, Levi once again held up five tentacles and created what appeared to be a fist, then bobbed it back and forth like a head nodding. An octopus that knows sign language. Not the most dangerous or extraordinary anomaly that the Foundation has ever discovered, but still, this anomaly could not remain out of containment. Hooper quickly contacted the research head at Site-12 and explained the situation. He needed a containment van for an aquatic anomaly, a containment force, and Class A amnestics immediately. This request was granted. Foundation Mobile Task Force Lambda-12 Pest Control stormed the building and wrangled the aquarium staff into a closet so they couldn't interfere. The agents were dressed in their tactical armor and held large rifles, but this was only to show that they were meant to be taken seriously and not to be used for force. A white, unmarked containment van arrived soon after. Foundation researchers ran into the building and transported Levi and his students into the temporary tanks of the containment van and made sure they were securely closed and locked multiple times. When each octopus was secured, an airborne version of A-Class Amnestics was distributed throughout the aquarium by the mobile task force agents leading to all knowledge of Levi being forgotten by the aquarium staff and Mark. For further containment, the SCP Foundation distributed liquid amnestics into the city's water supply, so that anyone who saw one of Levi's performances would forget that it ever happened. The SCP Foundation classified Levi as SCP-2967 and discovered the full extent of its anomalous attributes. SCP-2967, of course, has the ability to communicate through written language, is able to recognize and identify colors, symbols, and individual figures of other species, and holds an abnormally high intellect, almost comparable to an average human's intelligence. The six comrades of SCP-2967 were designated as SCP-2967-1, as they do not seem to be at the same level of intellect as SCP-2967. Through behavioral analysis and research, it was found that SCP-2967 will refer to SCP-2967-1 as its students, friends, or army. Dr. Reynard, the head researcher on the SCP-2967 anomaly, began hosting intelligence checkups on SCP-2967 every two weeks. These consisted of Levi talking to Dr. Reynard through the use of a waterproof magnetic slate while the doctor asked Levi questions. On one such occasion, the Foundation discovered that there may be more creatures similar to SCP-2967 and its students. Dr. Reynard began by drawing a crab, an octopus, and SCP-2967's toy. He labeled them Crab, Friend, and Toy. On its slate, SCP-2967 wrote Like, and then a sketch of a heart. Dr. Reynard drew a check mark on his clipboard before rewarding SCP-2967 with a prawn. Following up, Dr. Reynard asked if there was anything Levi didn't like. To display this concept, Dr. Reynard drew an X over a heart symbol. Levi paused for a moment, seeming to think, then drew what appeared to be a bird with outstretched wings and an angular beak. Upon finishing the drawing, the octopus's skin changed to a deep red color. Levi wrote, don't know word on his slate, then returned to its normal colorization. Renard displayed a photo of a pigeon to Levi, who marked an X on his slate, signifying that there was something wrong before shifting its skin black. In response, Dr. Renard returned to a picture of a crow to Levi, who scrambled to write on its slate. That word, it wrote hastily. Renard responded, crow. 
With his newfound knowledge, Levi drew a heart with an X through it on its slate, then spelled out, Don't like crow. Dr. Renard was confused. Oh. How do two species of creatures who live in completely different habitats have a disdain for each other? SCP-2967 began to explain. Levi sketched an octopus, a crow, and what appeared to be a human. Over the head of the human, Levi drew an arrow pointing at the human before drawing a check mark over the sketch of the octopus and the crow. Levi connected the check marks to the arrow above the human with two lines. It seemed that the crow's and the octopode's disdain come from their common ability to connect and grow fond of humans. The intelligence check concluded after Levi explained this to Dr. Renard, as the octopus claimed it was tired and wanted to return to its containment chamber. The next day, however, it seemed that SCP-2967 had correctly predicted what would happen at Site-12. On April 3rd, 2011, research staff at Site-12 reported a high concentration of American crows surrounding the building. Many were perched in trees or on the roof of the site, but some were simply hovering near the entrances, seeming to hope that the door would open. While the crows weren't aggressive to humans, they would fly to a window connected to the containment chamber of SCP-2967 and peck on it. This continued for hours, and it seems that the crows were threatening Levi and his friends. The Foundation deployed Mobile Task Force Lambda-4 bird watchers to Site-12. This team was not armed in your standard tactical gear and heavy weaponry. They wore camouflage clothing, with shoes that muffled their footsteps in grassy environments. They had jackets of thick leather to prevent injuries from talons or beaks. And they had specialized pellet guns they used to incapacitate anomalous birds. They began by shooting the birds away and capturing a few using nets for further study. As they concluded, all but one of the crows dispersed. This crow was, similar to Levi, much larger compared to non-anomalous members of its species. The large crow flew 10 feet from the entrance of the site and spat the decaying remains of one common octopus out onto the asphalt parking lot before retreating. The bird watchers attempted to follow the group of crows, but the flock was impossible to track. What was found, however, was an area in a nearby forest that contained an abnormally large number of feathers belonging to the American crow species, as well as numerous small makeshift huts made of sticks and dying leaves, and a collection of various litter fashioned into basic tools, such as hammers made of bolts and toothbrushes. The most surprising item retrieved during this exploration was the torn remnants of a copy of the documentation for SCP-2967, kept in the largest hut. As is standard, the SCP Foundation enacted surveillance procedures on this location, placing hidden cameras and microphones as well as traps. The large crow has been classified as SCP-2967-B. So it seems that the animal kingdom is at war for the favor of the human race. While the Foundation only knows for sure that octopodes and crows are at battle, there may be many more species out there who look to curry our favor. Who do you think will be the victors should battle commence? Now go check out SCP-247, A Harmless Kitten, and SCP-1111, The White Dog, for more anomalous animals that defy expectations.